Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we'll be covering chapter 9 and 10 uh, for Microbiology 2420. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with chapter 9, Controlling Microbial Growth in the Environment. So when you are dealing with microorganisms, you need to be able to, as a healthcare professional, control the growth of these microorganisms uh, to kill them or to stop their growth. And there are various terms you need to know in order to understand what you are doing and what an agent is doing to those particular microorganisms. Like what's the difference between antisepsis? What's the difference between disinfection, pasteurization, sanitation, sterilization? They all sound the same. They all sound similar, but they are distinctly different things, okay? So we're going to talk about that in this chapter. So two of the most common terms you'll come across when you're trying to uh, control microbial growth are sterilization and disinfection, right? Sterilization and disinfection, a lot of people use those terms interchangeably, but they are not interchangeable. They are distinctly different terms, and you need to know this as a healthcare professional. Most of you want to go into nursing, dental hygiene, etc. You really, really need to know the difference between sterilization and disinfection. So what is sterilization? Sterilization is the destruction or removal of all viable organisms. This is destroy everything, all right, including things like spores, spores gone, endospores I'm talking about. Uh, nothing can survive uh, a sterilization, right? And how do you sterilize things? Uh, well, in the lab, we've been sterilizing things with flame, right? If, if you put organisms over a flame, they are going to die. Even endospores will die. Uh, nothing can survive sterilization. Uh, another typical way in the healthcare se uh, setting that you sterilize things is uh, using an autoclave. We're going to talk about an autoclave later on. Okay. Now, contrast that with disinfection. Disinfection is not as stringent as sterilization. Uh, here it says killing, inhib inhibiting, or removal of disease-causing pathogenic organisms. See, this is the thing. It does not necessarily sterilize an object. You need to look at this here. Disinfection is good. You know, for example, Lysol is a disinfectant. But what does it say right there on the bottle of, of a Lysol? It says kills 99.9999% of, of microorganisms. That is not 100%. Endospores, a lot of times, do not get destroyed through disinfection. Disinfection is not as stringent. So if you disinfect a surface, that is not the same thing as sterilize the surface. Disinfect means there might still be something on that surface that can harm you, uh, that can possibly have not been killed, okay? So if I spray Lysol on a surface, I've disinfected that surface. I have not sterilized that surface. If I take a flamethrower and uh, burn the whole surface, then I have truly sterilized that surface, okay? So that's the big difference there. Now, here's some more definitions. Sanitation. Sanitation is when you reduce microbial populations to levels deemed safe, okay? Levels deemed safe um, for the particular circumstance. So, for example... Let's say I run a restaurant and you used my forks and knives in the restaurant and I need to sanitize the forks and knives. Do I put it in an autoclave? Do I put those forks and knives in an autoclave? No. Do I put them, do I put them over a fire? <laughs> no. Do I spray them with Lysol? No, I'm not going to disinfect. You know, I don't need to go that overboard. But what do I do? I can, you know, just wash with with gentle soap and water or detergent and water i can i can just wash the utensils that is not nearly as stringent as either of these you know so if i am sanitizing it's not as strict as sterilization and it is not as strict as disinfection but sanitation reduces the microbial population so i do kill some and remove some but just to levels deemed safe not to like 
99.99% or 100%. Okay, what's antisepsis? Antisepsis is when you prevent infection of living tissue uh, by microorganisms. So this is when you're dealing with living tissue, living tissue. So like if I put something on my... Uh, on my on my skin okay if I put something on my skin because I want my uh, you know let's say I have a cut on my skin and I want to uh, uh, treat it with chemical and that chemical will help prevent microorganisms from growing on my skin well that would be antisepsis so mouthwash is an example of antisepsis okay a antiseptic I should say all right so you get the point um, now, here's another interesting thing. Some chemicals can be both antiseptics and disinfectants. So, for example, iodine. You know, if you use iodine on your skin, you know, a lot of times you could use iodine to uh, kill microorganisms on the skin. But if I use iodine on a surface, that would be using iodine as a disinfectant. If I use iodine on the skin, uh, that would be using iodine as an antiseptic. So, Interesting to understand there. Okay. So what's chemotherapy? Um, I know a lot of you guys think that chemotherapy has only to do with cancer treatment, but that's not the case. You need to understand that in microbiology, we talk about chemotherapy as much more broad than just treating cancer. Uh, it's anytime you use chemicals, to kill or inhibit growth of microorganisms within host tissue. So if I have microorganisms growing within me, in my tissue, inside of me, and causing an infection, then I would use chemotherapy in order to inhibit or kill those microorganisms, all right? So here's, a, here's an example of chemotherapy you might not have thought of. How about antibiotics, right? Let's say I have a uh, staph infection, or let's say I have some kind of bad uh, bacterial infection, and I take uh, penicillin, I take some penicillin, that would be an example of chemotherapy. Okay, why? Well, because I used chemicals to kill or inhibit growth of microorganisms within my tissue. Okay, now here's some terms you should know. Any term that ends with the suffix cidal means uh, a, an agent that kills. Any term that ends in the suffix static means an agent that inhibits growth. Okay, so sides kill, statics, statics prevent the growth of. Okay, uh, so just be aware of that. Some agents are cidal, they kill. Some agents are static, they do not. Now, when I add... Uh, an agent to kill microorganisms. What you should realize is microorganisms are not killed instantly. If I if I spray my table with Lysol or 70% alcohol or some other disinfectant, if I spray my table down, not all the bacteria die instantaneously. There is a uh, logarithmic death curve that happens, a logarithmic death. Um, and look here, you can see that plotted out. You've got log number of survivors. Here you have six log base 10 and you've added the, the, the disinfectant and look what happens that the population numbers just get decimated in a logarithmic way. And what you need to understand is that again, population death usually occurs exponentially. Okay. And Every agent has what's known as the decimal reduction time, which means how long did it take to kill 90% of the population, okay? So that is the decimal reduction time. How long did it take to kill 90% of the population? Do you guys remember in lab, I tell you guys, if you spill E. coli or bacteria on your table, you should do what? If you remember, I tell you guys to spray the area down with disinfectant and wait how long? Jeopardy music. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, that's right. Five minutes. I ask you guys to wait five minutes 
and then wipe the area. Why do I ask you guys to wait five minutes? Why can't you just spray the table down with your disinfectant and then just wipe it immediately? Well, because that's right, the decimal reduction time is in the five minute range. You wanna make sure that you destroy all the bacteria possible uh, that you can with your agent before you wipe. Um, so yes, just be aware of that. Now, here's some more terms that are important for you to understand. Um, and these terms have to do with how easy is it to kill the microorganisms? Like, let's say I add a disinfectant to a surface. What would make that population easier to kill or harder to kill? Um, well, what about population size? Let's look at the first one, population size. If I have a large, huge population size, well, then it's going to take longer to kill those bacteria. Uh, what about population composition? What are the bacteria? What is their uh, uh, what is their makeup? What is their makeup? Are they made up of bacteria that are highly antibiotic resistant? Are they made up of uh, bacteria that have uh, capsules? Are, are they are they bacteria that have some other property that makes them hard to kill? What about the concentration or intensity of the microbial agent, right? So am I using a 50% solution? Am I using a 100% solution of disinfectant? Well, that would make sense. If I use a, if I use a 100% bleach, that might kill the bacteria a lot faster than if I use 10% bleach solution, you see? Um, the duration of the exposure. Again, did you wait your decimal reduction time, at least decimal reduction time, or did you just spray the area and wipe immediately? That's gonna affect uh, the, if, that's gonna influence the effectiveness of the microbial agent activity. What about temperature? Higher temperatures tend to increase the efficacy of the agent. What about the local environment? Okay, are you trying to, um, you know, are, are those bacteria inside of a biofilm? Are they hiding under some, you know, grit or are they hiding under water? Where, where are the bacteria? What is the local environment of the bacteria? What's the pH? What's the viscosity? What's the concentration of, of the organic matter? What's going on? That could influence the effectiveness of the agent as well. All right, let's go on to some physical control methods. Physical control methods include things like heat, filtration, radiation. Let's talk about that. So moist heat, what does moist heat mean? Usually when you're boiling water or boiling, okay? Moist heat. When we boil, when we use moist heat, we can kill things like viruses, fungi, bacteria, Boiling destroys a lot of organism, but does boiling sterilize, you guys? Does boiling sterilize? No, you need to understand that boiling does not sterilize. Um, boiling can destroy things like nucleic acids. Uh, it could degrade the nucleic acids. It could denature proteins and disrupt membranes, but that doesn't necessarily mean you've killed all of everything, okay? Um, remember, do you guys remember endospores? Yeah, the two genus of bacteria can form endospores. This is bacillus and clostridium. And endospores are actually resistant to boiling, okay? Please be aware that when you become a nurse, when you become a dental hygienist, or whatever area you're going into in medicine, you should understand that you cannot boil something and sterilize it. This is why your dentist, your doctor, did not bo simply boil the surgical instruments and then use them on you. The, the dentist or the doctor placed those surgical instruments into what's known as an autoclave. Autoclaves are like really, really strong pressure cookers, right? They, they use pressure to help increase the temperature of the, of the, of the steam. They produce steam and, and that steam can reach temperatures higher than boiling water. And that's strong enough to kill the, you know, all the organisms and kill the spores, okay? So boiling would be more of a disinfecting, a way of disinfecting uh, and not a way of sterilizing. Remember, disinfect means kill most of, whereas sterilize means kill 100% of. 
awesome. So this is what I'm talking about. This is an autoclave. You see what the autoclaves do? Uh, autoclaves use, I'm sorry, autoclaves use high pressure in order to increase the temperature of the, of the steam to, you know, sometimes up, you know, 120 degrees C uh, instead of boiling water, which is about 100 degrees C. And that pressure and that temperature, that can sterilize. So autoclaves are like pressure cookers. You can see the steam comes in, pressure and steam for forces the, those endospores to, to become disrupted. And that because uh, there's higher than 100 degrees C temperatures inside of an autoclave. Okay, so it's effective against microorganisms, including spores, including viruses, spores, fungi, uh, protists, right? All these parasites die to sterilization. So your doctor, your dentist, they use steril uh, sterilization techniques. That's why you'll find autoclaves in every clinical setting. Okay, pasteurization. Do you guys remember pasteurization? Our friend Louis Pasteur, he discovered a way of lowering microorganisms uh, in foods and beverages without spoiling the taste of the beverage, right? Uh, now, is this, as, is this a way of sterilizing? No. Is this a way of even disinfecting? No. Um, what, what pasteurization means is heating at temperatures well below boiling. So remember what boiling means? Boiling means taking solution or water up to about 100 degrees C. That's where water boils at 100 degrees C. Um, well, if per pasteurization, you're going up to maybe 70 degrees C, 65 to 80 degrees C. Um, this is, this is uh, not going to spoil the taste of the milk, the taste of the beer, or other beverages. It does not, uh, it definitely does not sterilize, but does kill you know, uh, a good majority of microorganisms, you know, the easy to kill microorganisms. What's dry heat? Dry heat includes uh, flames, right? So if I use fire, that would be a dry heat. There are these things called incinerators. You see this picture at the bottom, right? This is an incinerator. Uh, incinerators uh, become very, very hot. Uh, they can be used to sterilize. So you should realize that dry heat can can be good for sterilization. Flame, uh, heat, uh, intense heat. And by intense heat, I mean 160 to 170 degrees C uh, for two to three hours. This totally destroys uh, organic matter. Okay. Uh, what about filtering? We can use membrane filters. Uh, as long as these filters have pore sizes that are very, very small, that can uh, filter out. It can filter at, out bacteria. Okay. What you need to understand, though, is a lot of filters are not great at filtering out viruses, but they can effectively filter out bacteria. Uh, because viruses are much, much smaller than bacteria. All right. Uh, again, here's another type of filter. As a healthcare professional, you're going to learn a lot about these HEPA filter, these high efficiency particulate air filters. That's what HEPA stands for. HEPA filters can be found in these uh, tissue culture hoods, like this gentleman is sitting at a tissue culture hood. Uh, what the tissue culture hood does is it circulates the air. It circulates air. It circulates air. And up here somewhere is a HEPA filter. You see here, there's a HEPA filter. And it filters that air. So any kind of mold spores or any kind of other particulates in the air are filtered out. Okay. Now, ultraviolet radiation. Do you guys remember in lab, we, we used UV light in order to uh, kill bacteria? Well, UV is a wavelength of light. Ultraviolet is the wavelength 260 nanometers. And 260 nanometers uh, of light, that's the wavelength of light that gets best absorbed by DNA. And do you guys remember what I said? You don't need to know this for the exam, but this causes thymine dimers and also cytosine dimers. Do you remember if you have two thymines in a row, 
UV will cause the thymines to fuse to one another. That's called a thymine-thymine dimer. Or if you have two cytosines in a row, uh, UV will cause those cytosines to dimerize. That's called a cytosine-cytosine dimer. When you have these types of dimers, that can cause uh, mutations when the cell is trying to divide. And mutations can lead to cell death. Uh, but in humans, uh, it, they can cause also cancer, right? This is why UV can cause cancer in humans because when you get these thymine-thymine dimers or cytosine-cytosine dimers, basically pyrimidine dimers, that's when cancer can happen, okay? But in bacteria, that's when cell death happens too, right? Cell death, okay. So UV can be um, good for sterilization, um, but remember, do you guys remember in lab, did it penetrate glass or plastic or water? No, uh, UV can only sterilize if the bacteria are on the surface, on a dry surface, right? If the bacteria are on a dry surface, UV will kill all bacteria. But if the bacteria is under plastic, the bacteria is under glass, the bacteria is under water, um, anything, okay, uh, th th those, those bacteria are safe, okay? So it's not great. It's not great for sterilizing. Oh, and a lot of times, do you, do you remember these hoods I told you about, these tissue culture hoods? A lot of times you'll have like a UV bulb in there and the UV bulb will shine UV light and if there are uh, bacteria anywhere on the on the work surface of the tissue culture hood, the UV light will kill those bacteria. Okay, so that's kind of a good to understand. Another type of physical control is ionizing radiation. Okay, ionizing radiation. This is when you're using basically radioactivity. Uh, you're using gamma radiation, which is a very strong type of radiation. Uh, it's it's basically radioactivity uh, to to really penetrate deep into objects, destroy bacterial endospores, you know, not always viruses. So uh, even though this says use for sterilization, um, a lot of times it's not a great form of sterilization because it's not always effective against all viruses, okay? Uh, but let's say you have, let's say you have some heat liable material. You have some heat so let's say drugs, you have, you have some, some penicillin drug and you want to sterilize it. Are you going to sterilize it with heat? Probably not because the heat might actually destroy the drug. So instead, you could use ionizing radiation for plastics, hormones, sutures, uh, disposable, disposable supplies, food. You want to, you want to help, uh, uh, you know, you want to help sterilize food. You're going to use gamma radiation. So think about it. You're bombarding the food. You're bombarding the drugs. You're bombarding the hormones with, with, uh, with gamma radiation. That's not really heating it up. It's not ruining its, its um, efficacy or taste, right? But it's helping to, you know, disinfect or sterilize. Okay, this is just an overview of what we talked about. And that leads us to control chemical control agents. Let's take a quick break here. Um, I'm going to take a quick break, uh, and then we're going to talk about how chemical control agents help uh, with uh, microbial control. All right, guys. So break time. Hey everyone, welcome back from break time. Ready to cover control agents, chemical control agents. Let's get a, go ahead and get started. So chemical agents we use uh, in order to regulate microbial growth must be effective against a wide variety of infectious agents at low concentrations. Uh, they must be effective in the presence of organic matter they should be stable when you store them, and they should be ready to go once you need them. So let's start with phenolics. Phenolics are a type of chemical uh, that have these phenol rings, okay, the organic molecules that have this ring structure. 
Uh, a very common one is triclosan, which is found in hand sanitizers. This is uh, probably in the news a lot nowadays with uh, uh, what's what's going on with the viral infections. Uh, triclosan uh, is a phenolic, typically found in various soaps and hand sanitizers. Phenol itself is a strong disinfectant. Remember, uh, it was Lister who first used phenol to disinfect uh, his surgical instruments. Okay, alcohols. Alcohols. Uh, remember, if you have strong enough alcohol, that can be used as a disinfectant. 70% uh, alcohol. Anything above 60% is usually okay, but 70% is preferable. I know when I used to work in a research lab, we used to have a bottle of 70% ethanol ready to go. You can also use isopropanol as well. Halogens. Uh, these are the elements fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, iodine, and acidine. These, these halogens, these, these elements uh, attack lipids and proteins and disrupt uh, microbial growth. One of the halogens that's uh, very common is iodine. It's usually used as a skin antiseptic. Uh, in the healthcare setting, you'll see a lot of iodine being used on tissue, living tissue. And that helps to uh, keep the area contamination free. Chlorine. You've seen chlorine used in swimming pools, right? You ever wondered why... Uh, the pool person will put chlorine into a swimming pool? Well, because chlorine is a type of halogen. Chlorine it can destroy vegetative bacteria, fungi. Uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty good at keeping microorganisms out. Heavy metals. This is one you may not think about, but uh, metals like mercury, silver, arsenic, zinc, copper, they are very toxic against microorganisms. Microorganisms do not like to grow on, for example, if you have a silver coin or a copper coin, microorganisms don't like growing on those uh, coins uh, because the, the metal is very toxic to, to the microorganisms. Uh, a fun fact for you, fun fact, this is also why you've got copper plates on bathroom doors and stuff because uh, that copper will uh, repel the microbial growth, right? It'll, it'll uh, stop those microorganisms from growing. Quaternary ammonium compounds. Quaternary ammonium compounds are detergents that have microbial activity, okay? Example, uh, you would use these types of detergents as disinfectants for utensils, okay? They, this is what they would look like, these quaternary ammonium compounds. Aldehydes. Aldehydes include formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, and you might become very familiar with glutaraldehyde when you work in the hospital setting because 2% glutaraldehyde is used in hospitals. Uh, basically, it, it reacts with molecules. Uh, formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde react with molecules. They can cross-link molecules to one another, and that results in uh, sterilization. So glutaraldehyde, formaldehyde is very potent. It can be used as a sterilant. You can actually destroy spores. You can destroy vegetative cells. And it's very strong. And because it's so strong, because it's a chemical agent that's also a sterilant, it's used in hospital settings. Sterilizing gases. These are highly reactive gases that can be used to sterilize uh, heat-sensitive materials. Okay, and this is just an overview of those chemicals that we discussed. All right, this leads us to chapter 10. Chapter 10 Control, controlling microbial growth in the body. Remember what that means? This means that we're dealing with chemotherapy. Chapter 10 is about chemotherapy, agents that control microbial growth inside of the body, such as antimicrobial drugs, right? 
So again, what are chemotherapeutic agents? Chemotherapy, chemical agents used to treat disease uh, inside of the body, right? They, they destroy pathogenic microbes or inhibit their growth within the host, inside of the body. Most of the time, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with antibiotics. Antibiotics, uh, my, microbial products, or their derivatives that kill susceptible microbes or inhibit their growth within the body. Okay. Now, when we're dealing with chemotherapy, when we're dealing with these antimicrobial drugs, we need to understand how potent the drug is uh, and also how toxic the drug is. So what does that mean? Uh, toxicity of a drug relates to how uh, much the drug can affect the host. Let's say you're the host. You have an infection, right? Uh, I have, let's say, a, a staph infection. Well, then if I take antibiotics, I want the antibiotic to, uh, to, to, to treat me of the staph infection. I want it to destroy the staph cells, but I do not want the, the antibiotic to affect me. That's toxicity. Toxicity would be how the drug affects me. The less toxic to me the drug is, the better. And the more toxic it is to the microbe, the better. So this is what we mean by therapeutic index. Let me, let me explain this concept. So selective toxicity is the ability of drug to kill or inhibit pathogen while damaging host as little as possible. Selective toxicity, selecting for toxicity for the microbe and selecting against toxic toxicity to the host. A good chemotherapeutic agent is one that affects the host the least while affecting the parasite the most, right? Affecting the pathogen the most. Okay, to understand selective toxicity, we need to understand therapeutic dose, toxic dose, and, what, and what's known as therapeutic index. Let me explain these. Therapeutic dose means drug level required for clinical treatment. So what concentration of drug do I need in my body in order to kill the bacteria or kill the pathogen, okay? That's the dose I need to treat myself. What's the toxic dose? Toxic dose means drug level at which a drug becomes too toxic for the patient uh, and can cause side effects. So think about um, all, all molecules can be toxic to, to you, right? Uh, there's really no such thing as a safe molecule. Even water, if you drink too much water, you could die of water toxicity. Um, molecules are toxic, right? Uh, at what concentration in your body is a molecule toxic to you? So think about it. Um, Antibiotics can become toxic to you if you take too much, right? Any drug is toxic to you at too high a concentration. So the therapeutic dose is what concentration will treat you, and the toxic dose is what concentration is toxic to you. What you want is a large ratio between the two. That's what the therapeutic index means. Therapeutic index means the ratio of the toxic dose, of, of the toxic dose to the therapeutic dose. Larger equals better. You know what that means? Let me explain this. You want a drug. Good drugs are ones that kill, kill the bacteria at low doses, but harm you at very high doses. Do you agree? Good drugs are ones that kill the bacteria at low doses, but require extremely high doses to be toxic to you, okay? That would mean you have a large ratio of toxic dose to therapeutic dose. Larger is better. But th think, about, think about if the therapeutic dose was also the toxic dose. Think about that for a second. What if the therapeutic dose, the dose that can treat you, is the same as the toxic dose? Well, that, that means that you're going to get sick while you're being treated, okay? That's not good. So drugs that have a larger ratio are better. Uh, let's say you accidentally 
let's say you're 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 forgetful and you you don't remember if you took your antibiotic that morning what would happen if you took a second pill by accident and it was a therapeutic that had a low therapeutic index what if it was a drug that had a low therapeutic index and you accidentally took two pills instead of one well then now you might end up in the hospital does that make sense because that particular drug had a low therapeutic index and you took two when you should have taken one. Now, if it had a high therapeutic index and you accidentally took two, you'd probably be just fine. Okay. So, you know, uh, just realize in the healthcare setting, drugs that have higher therapeutic index are better because uh, it's harder to uh, affect the host and you're the host, right? The patient is the host. Let's talk about other effects of drugs. Um, drugs can cause side effects. What is a side effect? A side effect is an undesirable effect of a drug. Let's say you take a drug to help you with a bowel condition and then it causes, uh, I don't know, it causes acne <laughs> or it causes your, your heart to race, right? These would be called side effects, things that uh, are undesirable effects of a drug. And a lot of times drugs have side effects. Narrow spectrum drug, what does that mean? Narrow spectrum drugs are ones that attack only a few different pathogens or types of pathogens, whereas broad spectrum drugs attack many different pathogens. Do you guys remember the difference between cytal and static agents? Cytal agents kill microbes, static agents inhibit the growth of microbes. So let's talk a little bit about antimicrobial drugs. Let's talk about these. Uh, these are types of antibiotics. You may want to write in your notes here. Uh, you might want to write right here. These are types of antibiotics. You see, there are inhibitors of cell wall synthesis. There are protein synthesis inhibitors. There are metabolic antagonists. And there are nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors. These are four classes of antibiotics. Let's talk about them. So let's talk about the first class of antibiotics, the inhibitors of cell wall synthesis. The most uh, famous are the penicillins. You've heard of penicillin. Everyone's heard of penicillin. Penicillin is a type of cell wall synthesis inhibitor. What does that mean? That means that the way penicillin works is that it is a drug that affects the cell wall of bacteria. And do you guys remember that bacteria usually have a cell wall of peptidoglycan? Um, well, penicillins affect the microorganism's ability to maintain its cell wall. Uh, and the most crucial feature right here, you see here, the most crucial feature of uh, the molecule, the penicillin, is the a beta lactam ring. It's essential for its bioreactivity and it's the target of uh, penicillin resistant organisms. Let me explain. Look at this. this is, these are the penicillins. This is a molecule of penicillin G, okay, typical type of penicillin here. Um, you've got penicillin. This is penicillin. Uh, it's an organic molecule, right? You see? This is an organic molecule. And look here. This part of the penicillin is called the beta-lactam ring. This ring, you see this box, is called the beta-lactam ring. Uh, it's important for the reactivity of the penicillin, so how the penicillin works. But it also is the spot on the penicillin where some bacteria can, can attack. Uh, if the bacteria can make an enzyme called penicillinase, penicillinase can destroy this part of penicillin, the beta-lactam ring. Did you guys follow me on that? Let me explain that real quick. Some bacteria can make an enzyme. They have a gene for the enzyme penicillinase. They can produce the enzyme penicillinase. And what do you think penicillinase reacts on. It reacts with penicillin. So penicillinase can cleave pe penicillin right here. It can actually catalyze the reaction of destroying this ring, this beta-lactam ring. So you've heard of penicillin-resistant bacteria. Well, the way those work 
the way those bacteria work is that they can make penicillin ACE, an enzyme that breaks down penicillin right here at this ring called the beta-lactam ring. Uh, very interesting stuff. But another thing you should understand is penicillins are a big group, uh, a big family, penicillin G, penicillin V, ampicillin, carbinicillin, methicillin, ticarcillin. Uh, these are all types of penicillins. All of these affect the uh, transpeptization, transpeptidization, or formation of cross-links of peptidoglycan. Uh, basically, they prevent the synthesis of complete cell walls, leading to lysis of cell. Think about it. Penicillin prevents the bacteria from properly forming its cell walls, right? When it when, when peptidoglycan needs to link to adjacent strands of peptidoglycan um, via crosslinks, right, these protein crosslinks, penicillins prevent the formation of these crosslinks. Penicillins prevent the bacteria from forming a proper cell wall. And what happens? The cell lysis. Why do you think the cell lysis? Well, do you guys remember the concept of a hypotonic environment? If water is rushing into a cell because there's a hypotonic environment as your body is to a bacterial cell, well, then the bacteria can swell and swell and lyse. The only thing that was preventing the bacteria from lysing before was the cell wall. And now you've compromised its cell wall with penicillins, and that will prevent the cell from being able to keep itself together and the bacteria will lyse. So the way penicillins work is they compromise the cell wall and then the bacteria end up dying because they will lyse due to osmotic stress in a hypotonic environment. Okay. What you should realize too is that uh, penicillins uh, can cause uh, allergic reactions. Uh, a lot of people are allergic to penicillin. And as a healthcare provider, you need to understand that, and you need to understand that um, you need to um, be careful before just uh, prescribing penicillins because people can have an adverse allergic reaction to penicillin. Luckily for us, there are other drugs that can be used, like cephalosporins. These are cephalosporins that are very similar to penicillins functionally, but they are uh, prescribed uh, for people who are allergic to penicillins, but they but they act the same way. Look, they, they even have the same beta-lactam ring. Uh, these, these are drugs that affect the cell wall of bacteria. Vancomycin and tycoplanin are also other examples of cell wall uh, synthesis inhibitors. These are, these are uh, antibiotics that are used more rarely, but, but they're very potent in most cases. Okay, this leads us to another class of my, micro, um, I should say, of antibiotics. This leads to another class of antibiotics called protein synthesis inhibitors. These are antibiotics that bind to and inhibit protein synthesis, right? Do you guys remember what organelle is important for protein synthesis? That's right, the ribosomes. Remember the ribosomes have a small subunit called the 30S subunit. Ribosomes have the large subunit called the 50S subunit. Uh, the, these drugs, these, these protein synthesis inhibitors either uh, bind to and inhibit the small subunit or they could bind to and inhibit the large subunit or, or some part of this process basically. They could, they could inhibit amino acyl tRNA binding, so the tRNA from binding to the small subunit, they could prevent, um, or I should say to the large subunit, they could prevent the peptide bond formation at the P site of the large subunit, they could prevent the mRNA reading, they could prevent translocation uh, where the, where, where the mRNA moves through the, the ribosome. They could affect all kinds of things uh, that have to do with Translation. Do you guys remember translation? The ribosomes uh, orchestrate the process of translation. This is where proteins are made. Well, these drugs bind to the ribosomes 
and prevent translation. Can you imagine what would happen? Now, think about it real quick. Let me, let me ask you this. Do you think these drugs are cytal agents or static agents? Uh, do you think they'll kill the bacteria or maybe just stop the bacteria from growing? I would think static, right? Because if, if, if the bacteria can't do translation, the bacteria can't form proteins, the bacteria won't be able to grow, right? So I would, I would anticipate that these are static agents. Whereas remember, penicillins are cytal agents, right? Penicillins are cytal agents because they lead to cell lysis due to osmotic shock, okay? So let's talk about a type of Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about a type of protein synthesis inhibitor called tetracyclines. You may have heard of tetracyclines. These are the, they're called tetracyclines because of their four ring structure. It's an organic four ring structure. And what does it do? It combines with the small subunit of the ribosome, preventing tRNA right, from doing its job. Microlides, including erythromycin, this is another example. This is another example. This one binds to the large subunit of the ribosome and prevents uh, the peptide bonds from forming. Chloramphenicol, here's another example. It binds to the large subunit and that prevents peptidotransferase reaction. So you see, all of these are examples of molecules that prevent translation from happening. Now, Here's the third group, the third class of, um, uh, of uh, antibiotics, metabolic antagonists. What does that mean? These are drugs that, let's look at the definition here, antagonize or block functioning of metabolic pathways by competitively inhibiting the use of metabolites by key enzymes. So that sounds fancy, but let me break it down. The way they work is that they are structural analogs. What does that mean? They are drugs that look like uh, that look like key metabolic um, molecules that a, 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 a cell needs. Let's say, okay, let me show you an example. Sulfonamides or sulfa drugs look like this. Okay, this is a sulfonamide. This, on the other hand, on the right, is P-aminobenzoic acid. This is a metabolite. This is a metabolic molecule that bacteria need to grow. This molecule is used by bacteria in order to make this bigger molecule called folic acid. Folic acid is very important because, look here, uh, folic acid is a precursor to purines, and pyrimidines. Remember the, the DNA purines, the DNA pyrimidines for the nucleotides? Well, if bacteria are unable to make folic acid, this one, they are unable to make DNA, they are unable to make RNA, right? And without this P-aminobenzoic acid, you can't make folic acid. But what does the sulfa drug look like? Look at, this is a drug. What does the drug look like? the drug looks an awful lot like P-aminobenzoic acid. So do you know what the bacteria ends up doing if you treat the bacteria with this drug? That's right, it's a metabolic antagonist. It acts as a met anti-metabolite. Look, if you treat the bacteria with this molecule, the bacteria will try to use this molecule as this molecule, and they will make fake folic acid molecules. They will not be able to make the real folic acid. They will make an imposter molecule, and that imposter molecule cannot be used to make uh, purines or pyrimidines, and that cell will not grow. <laughs> Does that make sense? So these metabolic antagonists are drugs that mimic uh, metabolites, normal metabolites needed for growth, and by mimicking you're kind of uh, gumming up the works. You're, you're causing the bacteria to not be able to make important precursors it needs for growth, and then the bacteria is kind of stuck. So in that case, it's a static agent. All right, let's move on to nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors. 
nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors. You know what nucleic acids are, right? Their DNA, your RNA. So these are agents that prevent microbes from synthesizing DNA, from synthesizing RNA, right? So this would block DNA uh, replication. This would block transcription, okay, things like that. Uh, so these drugs would block DNA replication by inhibiting, let's say, the enzyme DNA polymerase. You guys remember DNA polymerase? It's the enzyme that synthesizes DNA. It inhibits DNA helicase. That's the enzyme that unwinds the DNA during d DNA replication. It can block transcription, right? This is the process of copying DNA into RNA, messenger RNA, the R the, it, by blocking the enzyme RNA polymerase. These drugs are not very selectively toxic as other antibiotics, um, but let's talk about a couple types. Quinolones, quinolones prevent the enzyme DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 2 from functioning. That's not going to be good because enzymes, uh, or I should say bacteria, need gyrase and topoisomerase in order to copy the bacteria so that they don't get supercoiling. Okay, so that's the only example of a nucleic acid inhibitor I want you to be aware of, quinolones. Let's talk about antifungal drugs now. So now we're moving on from antibiotics, the four classes of antibiotics. Now we're moving on to antifungal drugs. Let's talk about antifungal drugs. So obviously, as the name suggests, these are drugs that inhibit or stop the growth of fungi, okay? Now, what do we know about fungi? You should realize that fungi are eukaryotes, right? You and I are eukaryotes. So look at this. There are fewer effective agents that are antifungal drugs. Why? Because of similarity of eukaryotic fungal cells and human cells. We are eukaryotes. We are eukaryotes. Fungi are eukaryotes, so we're both eukaryotes. There's just going to be a lot more crosstalk. There's going to be a lot more similar proteins between us and bacteria. So it's going to be harder to find drugs that are selectively toxic, that have a large therapeutic index, right? You're going to have drugs that if they affect my proteins, they're going to affect the fungi proteins, and the fungal proteins may look an awful lot like my proteins. So um, because of the similarity between our cells and fungal cells, because we're both eukaryotic, well, you're going to have a low therapeutic index, and you're going to have a high toxicity. So this is why it is difficult to treat mycoses. What are mycoses? Mycoses are diseases caused by fungi, right? You will notice when you become a healthcare professional, you will notice that mycoses are relatively hard to treat because of this problem I just denoted. Now, superficial mycoses are going to be much easier to treat than systemic. What does superficial mean? Let's say on the skin, you know, if I have ringworm on the skin or if I have athlete's foot or something, that's going to be a lot easier uh, and more superficial. That's going to be easier to treat. But systemic would mean, let's say I get, I, I inhale spores, I inhale uh, uh, black mold, and that gets into my lungs and it gets into my, my system. Uh, well, that's going to be exceedingly difficult to treat. Systemic fungal infections are very difficult to treat. And you might need combinations of drugs to treat it. Let's talk about viruses. Let's talk about antiviral drugs. What you need to know is that drug development is slow uh, because it's really difficult to treat uh, and target viral replication. What you need to understand is a lot of drugs that are antivirals do not treat you. They do not um, destroy the virus or kill the virus. In fact, you can't kill a virus because a virus isn't technically alive, right? Um, and these antivirals, they don't um, rid your body of a virus usually. What do they do? 
they usually slow down the viral replication, okay? Antiviral drugs slow the, the replication of the virus. Viruses infect your cells, viruses take over your cells, and viruses use your cells as factories in order to make more of themselves. And these drugs, these antiviral drugs, what they do is that they can slow the replication down. Uh, a lot of times you could slow the replication down to, you know, to, to where you can't even, um, you can't even detect it anymore. You can't even detect the, the virus anymore, but the virus is still there. Does that make sense? If you are treated, your, your body will treat yourself through the immune system. Your own white blood cells will defeat the virus or not. In the case of some viruses, like the flu, uh, you could take a antiviral. Uh, for a good example is Tamiflu. Okay, Tamiflu is an actual drug that helps against the flu, the influenza virus. What does it do? It's a neuraminidase inhibitor. We're going to talk about what that is in a, in a subsequent chapter. It's a spike protein. And by inhibiting neuraminidase, uh, you are shortening your flu right uh, timeline you're shortening the flu you're 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 helping out with the flu but your body itself will treat you will rid the flu if you have something like a hiv infection on the other hand the antiviral drugs will slow hiv but your body is unable your white blood cells are unable to rid your body of the virus so you it's it's going to be a chronic lifelong infection even if you can slow it down your your body cannot treat you so you don't clear the virus whereas with the flu you, these these drugs will slow it down and your body will treat you so what do they do the antiviral drugs are not a cure it just shortens the course of the illness or slow, I should say slows down the, the viral replication. Your body, your body will rid the, rid your body, your body will rid yourself of the infection or not, right? Does that make sense? So antiviral drugs are not cures. They slow the replication down and your body will cure you or it won't, depending on the mechanism of action of the virus. So let's talk a little bit, I, I touched on HIV. Let's talk a little bit more about HIV drugs and how they work. You may have heard that HIV drugs are a cocktail of drugs. Um, what does that mean, a cocktail of drugs? Well, first of all, uh, I'm gonna put a link here to, uh, there. Uh, I'm gonna put a link to, actually it's gonna be on this side. Uh, I'm gonna put a link to, uh, another video where I explain what drugs are. Maybe check that out, it's very short. Um, but drugs are essentially small molecules that bind to uh, one of your important enzymes or proteins in your body and prevent that enzyme from working, right? So a cocktail of drugs would be a number of different enzymes that bind to a number of different, uh, I'm sorry, a number of different drugs that bind to a number of different enzymes in your body and prevent them from working, okay? So for example, let me show you. You don't need to know this in great detail because we're gonna touch on it in a subsequent chapter. But look, here's the uh, HIV virus, right? HIV virus needs to bind to your cell. Well, one of the drugs in your cocktail of drugs might be these these drugs right here, these are called fusion inhibitors. These drugs would bind to the surface of the, of the HIV virus and prevent the, the virus from fusing onto your cells, from, from attaching to your cells. Once the HIV attaches, um, there's other, other proteins, other proteins that need to do a job as well, like uh, HIV has these protease uh, enzymes. These are these are HIV pro, uh, enzymes that need to, to um, do their job so that HIV can um, reproduce itself. Well, another drug might be a protease inhibitor. This drug can prevent the HIV protease 
from doing its job. And, and if you prevent HIV protease from doing its job, HIV cannot form the proteins it needs in order to make more of itself. Um, HIV also needs another enzyme called integrase. Well, there's, uh, there's uh, anti-integrase drug. There's a drug that binds to integrase and prevents that from working. Um, HIV needs another enzyme called transcriptase or reverse transcriptase. There could be another drug that binds to reverse transcriptase and prevents reverse transcriptase from working. Do you see what I'm saying? So a cocktail means you've got integrase inhibitors, you've got reverse transcriptase inhibitors, you've got protease inhibitors, you've got fusion inhibitors. So you've got all these different drugs all in the same pill or not necessarily in the same pill, but all in the same cocktail of pills. And each drug slows the virus a little more. This, this drug prevents the virus from attaching to your cells. This drug, prevents the, the, this drug prevents the HIV from making more proteins. This drug prevents the HIV from integrating itself into your genome. This drug prevents HIV from copying itself into DNA. You see what I'm saying? So if every single drug is slowing the virus a little, the combination of all the drugs will slow the virus a lot uh, to the point where you can't even detect the virus in your system a lot of the time. Okay, but does it treat you? No, remember uh, um, antiviral drugs typically don't treat you. They only slow down the viral replication. Your body, your immune system will treat you or not. Okay, so moving on to factors influencing antimicrobial drugs. What could, what could affect how an antimicrobial drug works, right? Well, what about the ability of the drug to reach the site of infection? That's a big deal, right? If, if the drug can't get to the site of infection, it's not going to treat you. So what if, the, what if the site of infection has necrotic tissue, like dead tissue? Well, the drug might not be able to penetrate the dead tissue to get to the site of the infection. What about the susceptibility of the pathogen to the drug? If you're trying to treat yourself with, with uh, penicillin and the bacteria is penicillin resistant because it's, it, it creates uh, a beta-lactamase or penicillin mase, well, in that case, the, the drug is not going to be effective anyway, even if it does reach the site of infection. What about the ability of a drug to reach concentrations in the body that exceed the minimal inhibitory concentration of the pathogen? Well, um, think about it. Uh, are you taking enough of the drug? Is the drug reaching the, the concentrations in the body that are necessary? One of the problems with penicillin when it first came out was people would try to take it by mouth and the stomach acids were destroying the the antibiotic, right? They had to figure out ways around that. So, you know, can you get the right concentration in your body? Okay. Uh, what about uh, the mode of transportation? Are you taking the drug by by mouth? Some, like I just mentioned, stomach acid might destroy the antibiotic. It, what about, are you, is it topical? Are you putting it on the skin? Is it parenteral? Um, is it, is it through uh, those types of non-oral routes, right? Or is, it, is it being um, injected into your veins? Uh, is the drug uh, excluded due to blood clots? Is it excluded due to biofilms? Is it excluded due to necrotic tissue? Um, all of these are ways of stopping the drug from getting to the site of the infection correctly, right? You have to take into account blood clots, biofilm, necrotic tissue, okay? Now, what you need to understand is that we're living in a tough time right now. Bacteria are becoming more and more drug resistant, okay? Even viruses can f become more and more drug resistant as they mutate. And this is an increasing problem. Uh, there are actually bacteria which have become so resistant that it's very difficult or impossible to find an antibiotic that can treat you. Okay, and then at that point, you're, you're re resorting to removal of limbs and such to get rid of the bacterial infection. Okay, 
once resistance originates in a population, it can be transmitted to other bacteria. How? Do you guys remember the sex pilus? Do you guys remember conjugation? Um, bacteria can share information with one another. Uh, a particular type of resistance mechanism is not confined to a single class of drugs, right? So you can have multiple classes of drugs uh, being, being uh, actively resisted by a particular mechanism. Microbes in abscesses, okay, if, you, if a microbe is formed in an abscess or a biofilm, it may not be susceptible. Okay, and then mutations can also uh, form, spontaneous mutations can form that are resistant to the, micro or, uh, to the antimicrobial agent. Okay, and that's what happened in the case of methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, vancomycin-resistant Enterococci, um, vancomycin resistant staph aureus, right? All of these are examples of, of uh, strains, variants that are resistant to different drugs. Okay, in the healthcare setting, you're going to be watching out for MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus. You're going to be watching out for Versa, vancomycin resistant staph aureus, as these are two uh, common infections, usually of the skin that are very, very difficult and can lead to serious uh, uh, threats to human health, right? Uh, they are very difficult to treat with antibiotics, uh, and they are, you know, uh, becoming a bigger and bigger problem every day. Okay, so last concept of the chapter. What are mechanisms of drug resistance? How are these microorganisms becoming drug resistant? Well, Sometimes bacteria can prevent the drug from even entering the cell. Some bacteria are really clever. They can actually efflux or pump the, the antibiotic out of the cell. Some bacteria can inactivate the drug. They can actually destroy the drug. Do you guys remember when we talked about penicillin-resistant microorganisms? How did they resist penicillin, remember? They created an, an enzyme called penicillin ACE, which is also known as beta-lactamase, and that drug inactivates penicillin, remember, by destroying the beta-lactam ring. What else? They could modify the target of the enzyme or organelle. So, for example, through random mutation, you might be able to change the structure of the enzyme targeted by the drug. Or you can use alternative pathways. Do you guys remember a certain class of antimicrobial agent was called, uh, you had the metabolic antagonists? Well, what if you made a whole alternative pathway that used a different set of metabolites? Well, then you would still create the, the precursors necessary for the activity to continue, but uh, you know, yeah, and you would not be stunted by, let's say, sulfa drugs. Okay, and this is a graphical representation, or should I say an illustration, of how these different mechanisms of drug action work. All right, so that leads me to the end of the chapter. This slide's not so important. Uh, it's We already touched on this. Horizontal gene transfer is how uh, those microorganisms can share information with one another of how to become antibiotic resistant, okay? But otherwise, you should realize that uh, in the healthcare setting, we are trying to overcome drug resistance by giving two or more drugs at the same time, by only administering drugs when necessary. And by the way, you should you should realize as a healthcare worker that you're on, you should only give drugs when necessary. You should not willy nilly uh, prescribe antibiotics because that can cause uh, selection for mutants that are resistant to antibiotics. Okay, and later on, we are looking at things, other technologies such as bacteriophage. These are viruses that infect bacteria and other types of new novel drugs that can help against these resistant forms of bacteria as well. Okay, so that leads us to the end of the chapter. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I, I hope that was informative, chapter 9 and 10. Uh, again, please read through, uh, look at those major concepts, try to learn those the best you can for the exam, and I'll catch you guys next time.